Every professional athlete understands the power and the value of having a coach. No matter how professional the athlete can be or will become, every athlete understands the importance of a coach. A tennis player who doesn't have a coach to correct their form can and pretty much will result in injury. If a tennis player isn't corrected in the way uh, they swing with their wrist, they will end up with severe pain and problems later on in their future. So just the fact that you understand that a coach comes to correct, the correction that a coach brings into a tennis player's life, maybe just by the way that he swings the racket, it's so that they could avoid pain in the future. You understand that, right? Now the implications of having correction Oh, and by the way, a tennis player without a coach who does not receive correction in their tenure for playing tennis, they will never win championships. So if he wants to be a winner and if he wants to have some championships under his belt, he's going to have to have correction. The implications of having correction determine whether if that athlete will be a winner or a loser. So if you want to win and if you want to Go pro, you need to start with wanting correction. And it's the same thing in life. If we want to win, you need to go pro. And the only way to go pro is by switching your view on correction. So today's titled uh, sermon is Go Pro. <laughs> you want to go pro. And we all know that pro stands for professional. So you want to go professional. Now, this generation in many ways dislikes correction of any kind because we deem correction as a negative thing. And the reason why we deem correction a negative thing is because we don't understand that correction is actually an investment in your life and in my life. So when you don't understand correction, uh, you're going to punish the people who want to give it to you. And people that want to give you correction are just simply believing in you enough to invest their energy and their time in your life. But this generation hates any type of correction, yet the scriptures teach us that we must love it. Look what Proverbs 10, 17 says. It says this, people who accept discipline are on the pathway to life, but those who ignore will go astray. Look what Proverbs 13, 18 says. If you ignore criticism, you will end up in poverty and but if you accept, correction. if you accept, correction. people in the back, if you accept, correction. you will be honored. Wow. Now look what Proverbs 12, 1 says. To learn, you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate. Correction. Wow. I think for a lot of people, that is enough for today. Last one, Proverbs 15, verse 32. If you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. But if you listen to correction, you grow in understanding. All right, here's my first point. Common responses to correction. Number one, a rebellious attitude. When someone receives correction, here's the first attitude that you will see. A rebellious one. They will possibly throw a hissy fit first. The facial expressions will change. They will now sit and they will sit not normally, but they will sit like this. <laughs> have you seen that before? Yes. They just have an attitude. They get negative. They get, they get dark. Yeah. They are not happy to see you anymore. So when I give a sermon on correction and then someone didn't like it, they won't come into church going, hey, pastor. <laughs> now they don't want to talk to me. Why? Because they have a rebellious attitude. And a rebellious attitude means that they don't care if they show you that they're against the correction that you just gave or spoke. And uh, they will make you feel it. They will make you know it. And maybe they might not even show it because they're no longer going to show up. They decide to disappear. They go MIA for a little bit. And then after life gives them a nice few punches... Punches in the back of the head, because that's what life does. Life will punch you in the back of the head. It doesn't punch you face first. It will not show you. It's coming for you. And three years later, they're like, oh my God, you were right. Yeah. You know that now because you reaped the consequences of not listening to advice or correction. 
But three years ago, you turned into a brat, a rebellious attitude. That is the first common response. The second one is you gossip and complain. This is where you receive the correction and you're like, amen, yes, you're right, you're right. And I believe you, pastor. And thank you so much, leader. And praise God for your life. I'm so thankful that I have you in my life and you speak into it. And then you're such a two-faced because you leave the meeting and we ask you, is there anything else that you would like to say or ask or anything that you want to clear out? I learned that, that right? Like you have to ask before you dismiss the meeting, you have to ask, is there anything else are there any questions? Do you need any clarity? Why? Because some people have a terrible attitude and, and, and when they get correction, the first thing that they run to is to gossip and complain. So they leave the conversation, they're fine, fine, in quotations, and they meet up with people and they start talking smack saying, I can't believe that he thought that he could run my life. And I can't believe that he would say it like that. And I can't believe it that he told me this. And who does he or she think she is? And they start complaining. And I can't believe and I can't believe that. And I can't believe this. Well, you better believe it. You better believe it. That, that's, that's what we call correction. Someone say correction. correction. And that's life. Yeah. And you will have to have it. And if you have a, an immature mindset on how you view correction, you are either going to have a rebellious attitude or you're going to gossip and you're going to complain. Yeah. yeah. So what are you like, young man? What are you like, young lady? When there's a correction in an area of your life that you're so intertwined with, because some of the toughest corrections that we face are the ones that have become second nature to us. Something that we possibly grew up with. Something that we've done for years. Something that we run to. Someone that we run to. And then correction has to set in. And then because it's so a part of your life, it's become an identity issue. When you receive correction, you either become rebellious or you start gossiping and complaining. Or number three, my favorite one, you victimize yourself. This is where you took the correction personal and you took it as an attack. No, this is the hardest area for like uh, creatives. So if you're creative, your you know art or whatever you create is subjective. Whether if it's like graphic designing, music, songwriting, composing, whether if it's painting, whether if it's whatever, right? When you're creative, art is subjective. So what might be beautiful for you may not be as beautiful for somebody else. What is beautiful for me is really not possibly beautiful for you. Yeah. So in the church world, we have teams and part of those teams fall under the umbrella of creatives. Yeah. One of the hardest moments in ministry is to correct a creative because they take it so personal. And let me explain the dynamic, of course. The dynamic is that we as a church have a brand or, or, or a certain tone to our stuff and so another creative might come in, do their thing, and it's good, but it doesn't align itself to our vision. Yeah. Yeah. So when you have to correct a creative, oh my God, you got to fast for 21 days before that. Because <laughs> they might take it so personal. Yeah. And so you, you and, and, and this is all culture though. This is all teaching. And this is where, uh, as leaders, we have to kind of have the conversation that we're having today that, hey, your art is amazing, your creativity is beautiful, but unfortunately it doesn't align with our uh, vision or a standard or a brand yeah. and so you're gonna have to fix it yeah. well you're trying to say, and, and this is where the the, the rebel the, the victimized mentality comes in well you're trying to say that my work is garbage oh, I, I don't feel appreciated in this team what are you trying to say that i'm not good enough and and part of the victimization is language like that and sometimes it's not language sometimes it's tears yeah. it's because you took a correction and you made it personal and you took it as an attack to you. But correction is not attack. It's not, a personal, it's not a personal attack. A correction is just simply an investment. Someone say correction. Correction. Is an, is an investment. investment. All right, here's another one. You demean your coach. You start degrading the person that corrected you. You try to bully them or intimidate them or you try to, you try to degrade them. And I see this a lot with soft-spoken leaders. 
when their team members are stronger character than they are. There are leaders like there are teachers. Teachers are leaders, yeah. right, yeah. in the school system. And you know that there are teachers that when you walk into the room in a classroom, you have to sit straight, you have to shut up, and you have to listen, or else it's over for your life. <laughs> Anybody here ever had a teacher like that? Yeah. And then you have other teachers like Ms. Jones in you know, the B-Wing, the art creative teacher <laughs> who has no voice, isn't really tough on anything or anyone, and so everyone walks all over Ms. Jones. Yeah. Well, that's the truth with leadership, that there are some people that you will not pick a fight with because you know that they'll eat you alive. But then there are leaders or authority figures that you know are weak and you can control them and you can degrade them. But look what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 26. It is wrong to punish the godly for being good, or watch this, or to flog leaders for being honest. honest. So sometimes a leader will have to be honest with you and it will be uncomfortable. Will you flog them? Will you punish an authority figure? Will you punish a friend? Will you punish a parent? Will you punish a church leader in your life? A spiritual guide? Because they're being honest with you. And they're being honest because they love you. And they're trying to correct something that is going to lead you into pain or hurt. Can you imagine if I hired a coach to train me to play basketball? And every time that my coach would like correct my form, I'd like degrade home. <laughs> And here's the fifth one, manipulation. You manipulate. These are common responses to correction. This is like, hey, if you don't stop making me feel this way, I'm going to leave. God's first promise, God's first, God's first uh, command with a promise is honor your father and your mother so that you may have long life. So when we teach people to honor and we correct that, it's because we want to give you a place and a position and a placement in this world where you can have a long life. So if someone would try to manipulate, mm -mm. in Spanish, we have a saying, it's never, but we say it like this, nunca, nunca. Yeah, you're learning Spanish, praise God. All right, what are the wrong views of correction? Number one, we sometimes view correction as control. Get off me, you're trying to control my life. No, that's not true, no. We care about you, and that's why we have the risk, and we take the risk to speak to you. Here's my rule on correction. My rule on correction is this. I will give you the advice if we have the time for the conversation. I will point you in the right direction, but it's up to you if you want to take it. As a leader, I've learned that the worst thing that you can do is try to convince somebody to do something good for their own life. Yeah. It'll just break your friendship and your relationship with them. Yeah. So I've learned that as a leader, I give the advice, I give the correction, I give the godly counsel, I give the direction, and then, someone saying then? And then? It's up to you. Yeah. Say it's up to me. It's up to me. My question to you is this. How are you in inviting correction? Do you think that your attitude is one where you display that it is worth it to have the conversation with you? Because there's some people that you know it's not worth it to have a conversation. But who are you? Are you inviting enough? Or do you get offended quickly? When someone's trying to place an investment, here's what I've told my leaders. I've told my leaders this. If I correct you, don't let that like shake you up. And said, be glad. Yeah. Because that means that I still believe in your call. Yeah. That I still believe in your gifting and your purpose. But I said, be shook the moment I stop correcting you. Yeah. Like, 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 don't, don't, don't get like all like weirded out if I correct you. No, get weirded out when I'm silent. Because yeah. the moment that I went silent is the moment I stopped believing. Yeah. The worst thing that my parents could ever tell me, I'm 33 years old, just to let you all know. 33 years old, the worst thing that I could ever experience at 33 is for my parents to decide we will never invest in correcting you ever again because your attitude is nasty. That would be the worst day of my life because I know how much I need correction. I'm a young pastor. I need a lot of help. I need a lot of direction. I need a lot of counsel. I need a lot of correction in my life. And I don't run from correction. I'm the type of person that has been taught to run toward it. 
How about you? Here's another one that we see as um, a wrong view of correction, and that is intrusion. Intrusion means that you're intrusive. And that's where people feel like, hey, you know, this is my life. That's your life. Let me do me, and you do you. <laughs> you know, that's that type of attitude. People that feel like correction is intrusive are the type of people that show up late to church, leave early, because they don't want anybody knowing them. And they will totally deflect answering anything that has to do about their personal life because they feel like correction is intrusive so they don't want to let anybody in. Their walls are high and their walls are thick. <laughs> and no one's piercing those walls. You thought the walls of Jericho were big? There are some people that need a bigger miracle than what happened with Jericho. <laughs> Why? Because they feel like correction is intrusive. And correction's not. Correction's an investment. Correction's direction. It's a need. It's, it's a necessity. How many of you in this room know all the information in the world? I'm talking about languages. You know all languages? I'm talking about all math. I'm talking about everything that has to do in science. I'm talking about everything that has to do with cultures and traditions and I'm talking about geographical uh, information. Do you know all the information in the world? If, if, if we can put a pie chart and make the whole pie, all the information in the world, how much of the pie would you know? I'll tell you this, you probably know less than 0.0001%. Okay, so if that means that you don't know everything, doesn't that mean that you could receive correction? Yes. Yes. Don't you think that it's kind of prideful? Mm. Yeah, yeah. That when someone comes and tells you something truthful that goes against what you like or is against your preference, don't you think it's a bit prideful to be like, I don't need it? Mm. Yeah, but if you see correction as intrusion, you will not receive it. Number three, you can also see it as legalism. And this is like, hey, you're not God and you are trying to make me act a certain way so that I could be saved. That's not true. Correction has nothing to do with your salvation. Yeah, 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 right. Or maybe just a little bit. Obviously, if there's a lot of sin in your life, we need to correct that, right? Yeah. But I'm talking about correction in the sense of like just, just general life advice. Yeah. And so we sometimes confuse correction with legalism. And they're like, that church is legalistic. They're trying to like, you know, be religious and act all religious. And it's just not fun and it's not good and it's uncomfortable yeah because you confuse correction with legalism and another one the last one is that you sometimes can confuse correction with abuse and that's where you know you will have a conversation that is a little bit sensitive because it's a correctional conversation and the person receiving it on the other hand doesn't see it as correction they see it as abuse and so they end up leaving going church hurt there's church hurt. I'm not trying to say that church hurt ain't real. Well, I know it's real. I've, 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 I mean, I've grown up in church. I understand. And it's true. There is church hurt in the world. But some people in this generation are trying to confuse two different things. They're trying to confuse something that is beneficial for your life that is a godly principle and they're calling it church hurt. They're so abusive in there. They don't care about how you feel. And the truth is, we do care about you feel, but we care more about your feelings. We care more than just your feelings. We care about your life. Your feelings are just one part of your life. We don't just care for one part of your life. We care for the entire part of your life. And so that means that sometimes you will have a conversation in this life, either with me or with your leader or with a parent or a teacher or a boss. They're going to have to give you correction and they're going to have to help you. And then, you know, the fruitfulness of the conversation will depend on whether if you see it as an investment or if you'll see it as abuse. Yeah. Yeah. And correction should not be nasty. Correction could just be straight up, but it doesn't have to be nasty. It doesn't have to be offensive. Yeah. But it could be firm. Yeah, that's right. The Bible calls that a rebuke. <laughs> right? But we can't turn correction into abuse just because the conversation was firm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. How do we embrace correction? Number one, side with truth. 
Not your truth or my truth. No, not that one. Biblical truth. There will be times where you will have to do the right thing even though it may feel wrong. There will be times where you will have to do the right thing even though it feels wrong. You know what that's called? Sacrifice. Someone say sacrifice. Sacrifice. You want to know something interesting about sacrifice? It's sacrificial. So you know what that's going to feel like? A sacrifice. It's uncomfortable. It's difficult. It goes against your nature. It goes against what's easy. It goes against what you're used to. It goes against what you're comfortable with. And so when we have to make decisions that are sacrificial, you're going to fall into the dilemma of doing the right thing even though it feels wrong. Mm. I don't know who God's talking to, but I just felt that one. God's talking to somebody in this room. Mm -hmm. There will be times where the correction will be uncomfortable. Or sometimes it might even feel unfair. But this is where you have to reason with yourself and ask, if this is right, I need to do it even if it goes against what I want or what comes natural to me. Now, if there's an arbitrary situation, then we go to scripture and we must be people that are willing to side with the truth even when it's uncomfortable. Yes. Someone say uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Going pro means that we pre-decide. Someone say pre-decide. Going pro means that we pre-decide that truth comes first and we will do whatever it takes to live in the truth. Yeah. Not in what I feel is right. Yeah. Not in what I feel like is best. Yeah. Not in what I feel like everybody would like. Going pro speaks to persevering when it's tough. Yeah. It speaks to loving truth even when it goes against your preference. Yeah. It speaks to embracing correction even when it's unpleasant in the moment. Even when it's unpleasant in the moment. I'm going to repeat that one more time. Even when it's unpleasant in the moment. I'm still going to persevere through the correction. I'm still going to live under correction. I'm still going to receive the correction even if it's unpleasant in the moment. Now, where did I get that from? Well, let's read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Do you want to harvest? Do you want to harvest? Do you want to harvest a good family? You want to harvest a healthy home? Yeah, I want to harvest all that too. So it means that my ear has to be open to side with truth. I have to side with truth. Number two, if you want to live in correction, you got to remain humble and teachable. Yeah. Something say humble. humble. And I like this one. Teachable. <laughs> Look what Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15 says. It says this. Fools. That's not me. That's the word. I promise. <laughs> Fools think their own way is right. Mm -hmm. But look what the wise do. The wise listen to. Others. Have you met yourself yet? Like when there's an idea, look at me, when there's an idea, look at me, look at me, look, 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 when there's an idea stuck here in between your brows, okay, right in the center of your brain, and it's a dumb idea, do you listen to others? Correction is for people with all levels of gifting, experience, and success. It's easy to remain humble and teachable when you lack experience or knowledge. But the challenge comes after you get experience and after you have received some sort of success. There are some people that have certain titles in their life. They will not be open to correction because their PhD, their doctorate, their title, their bachelor's degree, even their certificate <laughs> is enough to puff them up to say, I don't need to listen to no one. I'm my own man. Or... I'm my own woman. <laughs> Miss Independent. And so you don't listen to anybody. 
Because you think that your experience, you think that your knowledge, you think that your wisdom, you think that your title has put you in a place of self-sufficiency where you are suffice. You don't need nobody else. That's foolish. Yeah. You know what else is foolish? Not being able to hear the truth from someone just because they're younger than you. Success is not an indicator that you can stop growing. Someone say amen. amen. And success is not an indicator that you have learned everything that you need to learn. Someone say amen to that too. Amen. The most successful athletes of our generation are those who are constantly seeking feedback and correction from their coach. No matter how pro they are, they don't move forward without a coach. Curry has a coach. Please don't think I was talking about food curry. <laughs> Talking about the basketball player, okay? <laughs> Every world-class athlete right now has a coach. That speaks volumes. So this is what makes me ask, then who the heck am I? Not to be open to correction in my life. Who am I? Like, I'm the leader of this organization. But I'm still seeking feedback. I'm still seeking correction. You know, my parents are my best friends. If they give me correction in regards to something that is natural to me and it goes against what is natural to me, even if I don't get it or see from their point of view, if they're speaking truth, I'm going to submit to them. I'm going to submit to them. Even if it goes against me even if it's unnatural. Number one, because I trust them and I know that they wouldn't give me advice to ruin my life. Yeah. And so that also means that in any relationship with correction, when correction comes into play, there has to be trust. Yeah. And so here's what I want to say to you. I know that if I ever, ever need to speak to you at a personal level and correct you, I know the first step that I need to take is earn your respect. Yeah. Yeah. I need to earn your respect. Yeah. And I earn your respect by treating you with respect, mm -hmm. by me remaining consistent to what I say that I am, yeah. doing what I say I'm going to do, yeah. sticking it through my tough and hard days, still show up. I earn respect that way. I earn, I earn credibility that way. Yeah. And so when I earn your respect, then I'm on my way to earning your trust. And when we have trust, the correction comes from a place of, I know that he loves me. Or I know that she loves me. So we remain teachable. And we, we remain humble. We remain teachable. And uh, no matter how good you get, there are always new lessons that you'll need to learn, especially in your walk with Christ. Yeah. Number three, how do you remain in correction? Um, you refuse to fear failure. You got to refuse to fear failure. Let me read this very quickly. Correction takes place when failure happens. So if we want to embrace correction, then we can't be afraid of failure. See, the truth is that failure invites correction. Failure invites innovation. And failure invites development. If we run away from failure, then we close the door to correction. In turn, this will lead us to stop growing. So correction due to failure is not the end of the world, my son. It's the other way around. Correction due to failure is a stepping stone to your success. I wonder how many people are paralyzed. How many people are afraid to step out because they're afraid to fail. So every time that you're trying to play it safe, every time that you don't step out, every time that you allow fear to paralyze you because you just don't want to fail, what you're essentially saying is, I don't want correction in my life. You fear correction. It sounds like you fear failure, but the truth is you fear correction. Failure is not the end of the road. Defeat is. Failure is a stepping stone because failure is what invites correction. If I don't try, I can't fail. But if I don't fail, I can't receive correction. How many of you are playing it safe because you don't want correction? How many of you are not stepping into what God is calling you to? Because it plays out as fear to fail. But in fact, it's actually fear to correction. And maybe you fear correction because of the way that you grew up, your upbringing. That any time that you made a mistake, the correction was severe. And the correction was just not even, 
was not constructive. It would deconstruct your soul. So then you learned a habit, and that was to not risk or take steps. Because if you fail, you will get punished. Wow. Mm. So in essence, it says, you know, refuse to fear failure. I think refuse to fear correction. Mm. All right, what is the root of rejecting correction? What is the root? And I'm, and I'm done with this. What, what is the root of rejecting? Well, I have four in here, and there are many, but I just wanted to pick four. Number one, a broken home. If a child grows up in a broken home, maybe an absent father, an absent mother, or maybe parents that were always fighting with each other, or maybe mm, you insert the blank. Here's what happened. There were never any foundational conversations like the one that we're having today. So the kid grew up not understanding correction. So when correction was given at work, it was foreign. Well, I don't, I don't understand. This is weird. I don't like it. Are they against me? They're trying to attack me. And so that's where you get people fleeing or that's where you get people resisting. And they'll fight and they'll defend. And that's why some people, the moment that you tell them, I have some feedback for you, they get defensive. And all their walls go up. And then their claws come out. <laughs> And, 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 and because I've been doing this for a while, like, oh, man, when I see claws coming out, like the proverbial claws coming out, I'm like, ooh, I already know what I'm dealing with. And then I just have to just really cater the advice in a different direction so that we can appease them a little bit and, and I, you, we meet them at their level. Yeah. But one of the reasons why people actually refuse correction, reject correction, is because of their upbringing. Yeah. Most of the young men that I have battled with in the church when it comes to correction because they just did not like it, they felt uncomfortable, they rebelled. Here's the... Dude, it's, it's, it's insane. I've been doing this for, I've been pastoring the church for 10 years, but I've been a Christian for a longer time. And back then I would only see the symptoms, but I never got to see the root. But after you do it for a while, you just don't pay attention to symptoms no more. You start paying attention to roots and their patterns. Here's the main thing with all the boys that would rebel in our church that never liked advice or correction, that had submission issues. I'll tell you what the main problem was. They lived in a home without a father. Fatherlessness. Created a rebel. And some of you might have siblings that are boys. And you're like, dang, my brother is a rebel. And dad was not home. And it clicks. Some of you, you are that guy. Hello. <laughs> and the thing is that like, the dynamic between a father figure, which is an authority figure in the house, that dynamic never got practiced or exercised. So when that doesn't take place, and then the person's older, and you try to have a correction, it's foreign and uncomfortable. And it makes them want to defend. A broken home. It's, in, it's, it's intense. What's another root of rejecting correction? Number two, past abuse. And I understand that some people have had Tough childhood, at home, others at school. You had a terrible teacher. I had one. Her name was Madame Ruggieri. I'm so sorry for calling you out on YouTube. <laughs> I pray you forgive me. I forgave you, but now you have to forgive me. Can I tell you something about Madame Ruggieri? She was a French teacher. I was in French immersion. So I'm trilingual. Bonjour, je peux parler le français. Si tu peux parler le français, moi aussi. Yeah, amen. No one got that. <laughs> um, this was one tough old cookie. She was a tough teacher. Holy smokes. I'll give you some examples, okay? Um, if a girl showed up, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not lying to you, okay? This is just so that I could break the tension a little bit. But if a girl showed up with a skirt to her knees, to her classroom, she was from Europe, so she's old school. If a girl showed up, with a skirt to her knees, or you know, like what you girls like to wear nowadays, like everything's cropped now. <laughs> I'm not trying to say anything. <laughs> you know what she would tell these students? She'd say, get out of my class. Get out of my class. And if you want to be a prostitute, 
Go to Hastings. Listen to me. Legit. You should say that. So I, I, I kind of had a little bit of social skills with older people, so I would try to like connect with her. Could never happen. Like I would try to suck up, man, but it just did not work. I would sometimes when I pass by her like classroom during like any other period or I'll come say, Bonjour, madame. If, if you want to speak French, just pretend that there's a, a horse stuck in your throat. And uh, no, there was just, no, she had a wall. I don't know who heard her. Someone must have. And, and I, the last thing that I remember before I called a meeting with her and all the parents was we had a, an assignment due. It was like 90 pages. So we had to type a lot, staple whatever we can try to staple. <laughs> <laughs> and handed her. And so she was sitting at her desk at the front and every single student had to line up. They had to line up and bring her the assignment. And uh, she wasn't going to collect it. You had to come to her. It was just really weird, messed up. And so I remember I grabbed my assignment and I'm lining up and I'm like, oh, okay, well, at least, you know, I did it. And I get to her and I put it down on her desk and she turns it over, looks at it, grabs a red felt, goes, tsst, tsst, grabs it and throws it at my feet. And on my first day, I forgot about this incident. On my first day, I'm chewing gum. Terrible mistake. <laughs> and she's like, uh, uh, <laughs> she's like, <laughs> she called me a pirate. I don't know why. <laughs> and she's like, go spit that gum out of here. I don't want gum in this class. So I'm like, okay. I hadn't known her yet. I didn't know who she was. So I got up, went to go spit, and I spat the gum in the trash can at the back of the room. And then she yells at me from the front. She says, not my garbage. Just take that trash out and put it in the garbage outside. And there was a ton of garbage in there, and my gum was stuck to the, to the freaking bag. So I had to spend, the, this was like my first year in that school. It was my first day in that classroom. And I spent like 10 minutes trying to unglue the gum. <laughs> so some of us have had authority figures that maybe just abused their power just a little bit. And so what that creates is a distrust. And so now any authority figure that steps into your life, whether good or bad, you don't see them. You see the past abuser. Have you seen that? Like, there are some people that just remind you of somebody that you don't like. And without getting to know them, you just decide that you didn't like them. Because they reminded you of somebody else. Th that's exactly what happens with correction. Mm -hmm. That's why I told you that trust and respect has to be earned first. All right, number three. The root of rejecting correction. One of them is ignorance. No one taught you about it. No one told you about it. No one had a conversation with you about it. So you ignore it. And because you ignored it, the moment that you encounter it, you reject it. You don't see the value in it. How many people sometimes are holding millions and millions worth of treasure in their house and they have a yard sale and they sell their treasures for two bucks without knowing that they were giving and trading millions for a toonie. And then some person passes by who does not ignore the treasure, picks it up, rips that person off for sure, sells it for the millions. And the person that sold it at the garage sale goes like, I had no clue. You know what that's called? Ignorance. You don't know what you hold. You don't know what you have. Some people reject correction because they have no clue. Ignorance. That's why, as a pastor, these conversations to me are so important to have with you. You want to know why? Because I love you. And I want to see you succeed. I want to see the patterns in your family break. 
The bad ones, the bad ones, not the good ones. Keep the good ones. I, I, I want to see you become fruitful. I want to see you become a present father. I want to see the young men grow up before 26 and, you know, you know. I, I want them to start walking in steps of maturity. So I pray in Jesus' mighty name that you never take correction as a punishment or as someone trying to control my life. And even though there has been past abuse in your life, in Jesus' name, I'm going to tell you this with all the confidence inside my bones. In this church, you are in a safe space. Amen. Okay, what is the root of rejecting correction? The fourth one is pride. Self-righteousness. Um, in the Spanish campus, I titled it Extreme Holiness. Because yeah, there are some people that are very prideful, but they mask pride with being really holy. And they're the type of people that you can just almost like believe the lie that they had coffee with Abraham this morning. <laughs> like, dang, the way you like talk, y'all. Like, have you noticed? I don't know if you've noticed if you've been in the church world well, long enough, but there's some people that when they pray, they change their tone. They're like, dear Father God. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't talk like that in real life but that's just a facade it's extreme holiness or like when they come up here and preach the, like if they're extreme holy they'll be like my children <laughs> can you imagine if I came up here right dressed in a dress and I would my children <laughs> welcome to grave church your Space of grace. Let us bow our heads in reference to our Father God. Can you imagine if that was the style that I preached to you? You would possibly call me fake, yeah? yeah. And if you didn't, you got played. Because there's no way that I'm at the dinner table talking like that to my friends. You know, my acquaintances. I don't talk to my friends like that. I don't talk to my parents like that. I'm not talking to my dad in a dumb religious voice, dear provider of the familiar household. <laughs> I don't talk to him like that. But there's some people that are just so fake holy. These are the toughest people to ever correct. You want to know why? Because the only person that they allow to correct them is God. People that have a singular relationship with God, horizontally, no, no, vertically, sorry, but have no horizontal relationships with people, they are the most dangerous people you could ever trust. Because they're not going to be accountable to anybody. They're not going to receive any correction from anybody. And sometimes there are sheep that lack sense, not even common sense, just sense, period. <laughs> And they will, in a moment of correction, tell you, oh, it's okay, I don't receive correction from no one because my correction comes from the Lord. Well, number one, that is not biblical. And number two, you're full of pride. You're full of pride. People that don't like to receive correction, one of the reasons why is they're proud. And they don't like anybody talking to them. And they don't like anybody correcting them. In Proverbs, there's this passage that blew me away. And I want to end with this passage, okay? It's a passage where a father is talking to his sons. And this can be applicable for both male and female. He's speaking to his sons. And he's speaking to them about relationships, actually. And he tells his son, stay away from her. Mm -hmm. So the father is giving the sons correction. One of the sons does not take the correction. And then he writes down his laments, his regrets. I want every single one of us to pay attention to the regrets that this guy writes so that we ourselves don't ever end up in this place. Pay attention to the language. Pay attention to the consequences. Pay attention to the words. You ready? Proverbs chapter 5. Let's put it up. It says this. So now, my sons, listen to me. Never stray away. 
never stray for, from what I'm about to say. Stay away from her. Don't go near the door of her house. That's prophetic for somebody here. I don't know who that's for, but all I can tell you is don't go to that house. Next slide. If you do, you will lose your honor and will lose to merciless people all that you have achieved. That's a bad consequence. So that, that's the advice. Strangers will consume your wealth and someone else will enjoy the fruit of your labor. That's a tough consequence. In the end, you will groan in anguish when disease consumes your body. Now, what's interesting about that is that I've met friends that have received some severe diseases in their bodies. Because they chose not to listen to advice. I had a friend once call me. He, had, he was a part of a church. He left our church. And he called me one day. He said, I need to meet with you. And he was crying on the phone. And uh, we met up after not seeing each other for a long time. We sat across from each other at a Starbucks in Brentwood. We hugged. We said hello. Sat down. Stared at me. Started bawling his eyes. And he said, I have an STD. And he told me what it was. He's like, I don't know how I got here. I have another friend that used to be a worship leader. He used to be a worship leader in church. Became gay. Started sleeping around. Moved to Davie Street. No joke. No lie. And all of a sudden, one day, I get reports. This young guy, who was a worship leader in a church, now has AIDS. You will say, how I hated discipline. See, that's when life gets real, and that's where you realize the value of correction. Yeah. How I hated discipline. Watch this. If only I had not ignored, say it with me, all the, Warning. all the Warning. warnings. God warns before he allows the consequence to come, and that's God's mercy. God warns you, hey, if there's something that God has been warning you about, please do it. Take the correction. Yeah. How I hated all the warnings. Oh, why didn't I listen to my teachers? Why didn't I pay attention to my city group leader? <laughs> Let's read that in the Marlon Medina version. Oh, why didn't I listen to my pastor? Why didn't I listen to my City group leader. Mm -hmm. Next verse. I have come to the brink of utter ruin. And now I must face public disgrace. Dang. Those are the diaries of someone that did not listen to correction. So when I have a sermon like this one, what do you think I'm trying to achieve? To abuse you? To control you? To intrude in your life? What do you think I'm trying to achieve? To get in your face so that I can just preach a spicy sermon and get some reactions from the crowd? No. You know what I'm trying to achieve? For you not to end up journal entries like that. Yeah. Amen. So I have this quote. Put it up. The greater your capacity to receive correction, the more you can be trusted. My question is this, can God trust you with a healthy marriage? Can God trust you with a wealthy business? Can God trust you, look at me, with power and influence? Can he? A lot of what God will entrust to you depends on how well you adhere to correction. 